All right. This week is uh, part the week we, we play catch up because uh, in uh, Israel they're doing a double parsha. They're not. In Israel they're, they're doing. Not. They're doing the Or oh, no, they're, they're doing bechotai. They're doing right. They're doing bechukotai, and here we're doing bahar and bechukotai. We're doing a double, so we're we're playing catch up. That's how we're catching up. Right, that's what we're doing. So we're doing Bahar Bukh Kosai. Right. Get, uh, so if you're a Bar Mitzvah boy, it's better, be better to be a Bar Mitzvah boy in Israel this year than to be in uh, You got the double. Uh, okay, so we got the double Parsha. Bahar Bukh Kosai, and there, there, Bukh Kosai. I'm just going to share with you some thoughts. We'll see how we can tie some of them together, but. Um, The, the Parsha introduces the laws of Shemitah and the laws of Yovel. Right? What's the law? That after we came into Eretz Yisrael and we divided up the land amongst the tribes, so the, every seventh year, the land should lie fallow. Not allowed to work the land. Um, and every 50th year, then you had a double year of the year being fallow because it was a Shemitah year followed by a Yovel year. So you had a double whammy, two years in a row. So look at the introduction to the parish. It says, Moshe Bahar Sinai So this is famous Chazal, Rasha brings it down, that Hashem told Moshe at Har Sinai saying, and then he teaches him the laws of Shemitah. So Rashi's famous question is, my Indian Shemitah et al Har Sinai. What is mentioning Shemitah Bahar Sinai? Right? So, Halakola mitzvos nem ruba Sinai. All the mitzvahs were given. He, told, he spoke to him from Har Sinai, telling him, you have to keep the laws of Shemitah. All the mitzvahs were given at Sinai. Why is it emphasizing it here? So, Ella ma Shemitah nem ruka lasea pratoseha. Just as all of the specifics and details of Shemitah were uh, given at Sinai, as the Parsha is about to mention, all the details. So you should know this is from Sinai, so to all the other 613 mitzvahs. All 613 mitzvahs were given with all of their principles and details at Sinai. So the question really begs, why are we bringing this message out through the mitzvah of Shemitah? You could have said the same thing. Could have said any other mitzvah in the Torah could have been introduced by Har Sinai, Lamar. Well, why is Kashrus mentioned uh, by Har Sinai? They're all mentioned. So you could have said the same thing. So there's different answers to it, but one of the standard answers that are given is that, that Shemitah is, the significance of Shemitah is that it's the it's the mitzvah of emuna. That is the basic mitzvah of emuna. I want to develop that thought a little bit. But Shemitah is the concept of recognizing that God runs the world. That's the one year out of seven in an agricultural society to not work and buy into that. That's, that's emuna. Get into that a little bit more to fill up what that uh, that means. Um, it's interesting. We have in last week's parsha, in Parsha's Emor, we start off talking about the Kohanim. Talks about the Beis Hamikdash. It talks about the uh, you have the Kohanim, you have the Beis Hamikdash, and then you have the Moadim. The, uh, the holidays. And here it's not so much Shemitah. So I saw a couple of questions take the following line, very interesting. It says in last week's parasha, talking about the Kahanim, you're talking about the Kedusha Saguf. There's different types of holiness that people have. The holiness of the person. Then the Makkum, the Migdash, is the holiness of the Vesa Migdash. Then you have the holidays, the Kedusha, the holiness of the Zman. And here we have Kedusha Sa'aretz. Of the holiness that's associated with the land, that's the uh, the way the it's built up. But listen to the pasuk here. 
says, When you come into the land, right, in the times of Yeshua, they're going to come in. And then the land has to rest for Hashem. That statement is not really true. They didn't start keeping the Shemitah when they came into the land. First of all, you have to count seven years, six years before you start counting. But else they had to divide and they had to, they didn't start until, until 14 years in. So why does it say when you come into the land, you're going to start counting the Shemitah? I mean, you're going to, you're going to start, the land's going to start rest, resting. It didn't start resting at that point. It was only later on. Later on. So you need to understand that. Also, we have interesting, you have the laws of Shemitah, you have the laws of Tzedakah, you have the laws of, um, you have the laws of Ribis, trying to interest, Ribit, uh, the prohibition of taking a Ribit, right? Uh, so just these are, these are the things that are, are listed uh, right next to each other, some laws of cheating, In, in Bahar. Bukhokosai goes into the Tawhukha, other things as well. So we just discuss a little bit, the, I think a message, a, a, an underlying theme here, which I think will have tremendous repercussions. One thing I saw of Moshe, of Moshe Feinstein, uh, Zatzal, says something that I think, I, I, I think we can internalize. I think it's a tremendous, tremendous message. It's an educational one. He says like this, he says that, now remember, he's writing this in the 60s, right? So he says that one of the major differences between the youth of what he sees going on in America in the 60s and the attitudes that he saw in Europe, he says the difference is, he says that in America, he writes this in, in Hebrew, it's interesting, he writes, we're all interested in good time. He writes the Gimel Vav, he writes the, the focus is good time. What does he mean? He says, what does he mean? He says there is the pursuit, there's a hedonistic pursuit of pleasure. That's the, he says that they have never saw that until, like, in Amer- it was like an American thing. Now even though, you know, you read about the pre-war Europe, they had like their, 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 their hot springs and they had like, you know, their palm springs of the time, or Nuremberg, wherever it was that they would go to. So they did have, like, there's a concept of vacation. They had that kind of, uh, you know, people did that. If you could afford to, you did it. So, but he says a very interesting point. The point is like this. He says that the generation in America today and what children see from their parents as well, and you see it around, is we live for the vacation. Right? People spend the whole year, it's like, I, for the hotel in the uh, for Pesach and for what we're we gonna do winter break and what are we gonna be doing over the summer, it means you live for the for the good time. You're living for that instead of re- realizing and 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 he said in Europe you had that, but the reason why you took off you have to recharge. You have to uh, person can't just work all the time. It's make yourself more effective. When you are working, you need to take the break. But it wasn't that the break was the purpose of why I'm working. The break was to make me effective when I'm not taking the break. And he says in the 60s, he says he, he's reflecting on his generation, and today, and you see it even more today, is that it's all become about the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of le- leisure, the pursuit of making things easier. You know, so we're going, we, we work from vacation to vacation. It's an interesting insight, because, and that's the message we give over to our children. So you lose the value in the intrinsic value of the work itself, because the work is only, the purpose of the work is only to be able to get to the vacation, but the value is in the vacation, the value is not in the work. I just have to do the work, because without the work I can't get to the vacation. And he says that's a, 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 a major change in understanding, but you think about it, it devalues everything we do because we're only putting our value in the times that we're not working, in the times where we are 
You know, and so I thought it's very interesting because you look in the in the laws of Shemitah, there's actually a machlokas between the uh, the Rishonim as to what the reason for Shemitah is. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's a really a machlokas or not, but you know the Sefer Chinuch brings down is that if you work land continuously and you don't stop, you deplete the uh, efficacy of the land being able to produce. So you have to take off the one year to allow it to be productive the rest of the time. The other Rishonim say the shot is that you need one year like to be in Kola. We need to recharge our batteries. We need to be able to have one year that we just completely connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The, the, the Ramam describes it like everyone would go into the base medrash for a year and sit and learn. You don't have to worry about being in the field. You don't have to work. It was like a... But it's a recharging. It's a recharging whether it's on the land, whether it's on the person, I think it's the, the same concept of it. But I, I think tying it into Amuna is really where I want to go, the angle that I want to take, because I think this, to me, will uh, hopefully offer some new insights. The Kli Yakar says something unbelievable in the laws of Ribis. We know that Napoleon... Right, there was a, when Napoleon came to power, his platform one was like equality and allowing freedom of, of, of religion. And a lot of the concept of the, of the freedoms that were introduced by the founding fathers of the United States were built on the platform of the French. The French actually fought side by side with the Americans against the English. They identified with the, but you, 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 know, you see a lot of the concepts of, of the American Revolution, the seeds of that were taken from the Enlightenment. From, from the Enlightenment, from, the, from, from France. There's another thing, by the way, is Ukurasim Dror Ba'aretz, that you'll proclaim freedom in the world, in the land, you know where that's written. It's in the Torah. Where else is that written? If you go to Philadelphia and you go to the oh, Liberty, the Bell, Liberty Bell, Bell, on the Liberty Bell, the, that's, and you'll proclaim freedom in the land, the concept of freedom that's actually taken from the parsha over here. But nevertheless, so when... when uh, and, by, and by the way, it's fascinating. In the Jewish world at the time, when Napoleon went to war against the, the Tsar of, of, of Russia, the Jewish world was split. Because the Tsar, we know what he was for the Jews. I mean, he was oppressive, no freedoms, but you know, it, it was, uh, they suffered horribly under the, uh, under the Tsar. And now you have Napoleon is promoting freedom, you know. It's a, however, you had, so many were backing, more of the progressives were backing Napoleon. But in the, 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 one, of the, uh, the one of the Rebbes, the, uh, I don't know which one it was, or maybe it was, which was Babich Rebbe was a time. Alter Rebbe. Was the Alter Rebbe. He backed, he said we should back the Tsar. He felt that... He sent spies to the Bohemian's camp. Right. He felt that, that, the, that the, the freedoms of Napoleon would actually be detrimental to Yiddishkeit, which is like an unbelievable thing. And so there were people that fought, fought on both sides. Jews that fought on... Both sides. I mean, in the First World War, you had that too, in, in, with the Germans, so you had that too. But the point is that, but he was the promotion, he promoted freedom of religion. So one of the things that Napoleon did uh, when he they, uh, they, uh, overthrew the, uh, the royal uh, uh, Autocracy or whatever it was in, 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 in France when he took over. So he wanted to reassemble the Sanhedrin in order to give the Jews a sense of uh, freedom. He wanted to unite them all on, and he chose like he, he, rabbis from all over the, you know, from all over wherever he was in control that should be part of his Sanhedrin. And it was interesting because there was some progressive, there were liberal rabbis, it was like across the board. There were actually some very hush of rabbis too. In fact, in Tanakh, you can't learn Tanakh today without the commentary of the Mitzudas David. Mitzudas David was one of the rabbis that was on Napoleon's oh. Sanhedrin. And he asked them a bunch of questions. 
He presented to them that they should respond. We have it. We have the questions that he said. One of them was, why is it permissible to take interest from a non-Jew, but it's prohibited for a Jew to take interest from another Jew? That was one of the questions. It was bothering Napoleon. Usury, the laws of usury, the laws of ribbis. It was, that wasn't a small thing, by the way. That was a huge thing, because... Uh, the, you know, the, it's interesting how the church took on certain things. One of the things that the church took on is that usury, that ribbis is prohibited. That it became, that usury was like, well, that was one of the things that they took on from the Torah, you know. It's a big deal that usury is prohibited. And they used that as an excuse in, 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 uh, in the 13th century, 12, whatever it was, Jews were expelled from York and London. And all their businesses were confiscated. And the reason was because they, they dealt in, in ribis. They would, but that became, by the way, the, po- the, the popes f- figured out a good way that non-Jews aren't allowed to take ribis, and they would only allow certain Jews to lend with ribis, and they had to get kicked back to the church. And what happens is when, it in, when, when the amount of money owed got so great, they would expel the Jews from the country. It was like that was the that was the financial plan that they came up with, and um, so so ribbis was a big thing amongst the, uh, the, the the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and they, they turned it. And, and you, you know, even if you look at even you see the sense of the time, you know, you read Shakespeare, uh, Shylock, you know, in in, uh, in Shakespeare, who was Shylock? Shylock was the Jew that would lend with interest. You know, and there was, I don't know if the other character was in there. They would not, you know, lend with interest. And the whole the story, I don't know if you read the story in, in, in Shakespeare, is that uh, where the, the word a pound of flesh comes from is because Shylock, the person couldn't pay him back, and Shylock required he give him a, a pound of muscle from his chest. Cut out. Eh? That, that's, you see the sense that a Jew is willing to take his pound of flesh from the non-Jew in interest. That was the prevailing sense of the time, of, you know, that was in, uh, you know. Uh, so anyway, the point is that, that that's a serious question. You know, if interest is so serious, then why is it okay? In fact, the Rambam makes it even worse. The Rambam says it's a mitzvah to take interest from a non-Jew. Right? So we've spoken about an answer in the past. I want to, I want to give you the clay yakar because I think it helps us here. But the, clay, uh, the answer we've given in the past is that, which is the Ramam himself says, the Ramam himself says, and I guess where he was in the areas that he lived in, even t- today, you know, commerce doesn't work without interest. If you don't, if you, if you don't charge interest, people aren't going to lend money. If people aren't going to lend money, then you can shut down uh, a, uh, what's that? An economy. You, you need lending to generate, interest rates would generate the economy. So, the Ram says, and since non-Jews, aside from those few hundred years where they figured out a way how to do it, but generally non-Jews, he says, uh, lend with interest. So if they lend each other with interest, then there's nothing wrong with us doing it. But the deeper insight with the Rambam into the Rambam is like this. You have a kid, or you have a brother, or you have somebody that needs money, Right? Most healthy situations, if you have the money, you give the money. You don't sit down and say, okay, you need to give me you know, 8% or 10% or let's look at prime. And you don't start doing that because, you know, if family, if you have the money, you help with family. Bozuk says by interest, as a v'chaya chicha imach. The whole idea of interest is that you're supposed to look at every Jew as if he's your brother. If he's your brother, your brother, you wouldn't charge interest. So this is the way of affirming that connection. The family, you don't charge interest. Your next-door neighbor, it's not family, you can charge. There's nothing wrong with interest. It's just your brother, you don't charge interest. So therefore, so the way to show that means if you did, if your next-door neighbor is, who's the guy and you don't charge him interest, you're missing the whole point of this, the point of this. So it's a mitzvah to charge him, not because it's bad. That it's bad to charge him interest. No, because you need to show there's a difference between who's your brother and who's the next door neighbor? And therefore, that's the that we spoke. That's an insight we gave in that before. I want to tell you the Clay Yucker. Clay Yucker says an unbelievable thing. He says that Parnassa, 
The fact that we need to put effort and work into earning a living, he says that is from the, uh, the curse of Adam HaRishon. That through the sweat of your brow, you will eat bread. Means originally, Adam was put into a five-star hotel. Adam HaRishon had everything there available to him. Even the, the, there's a misfortune that say that bread grew from the ground. We make the bracha, hamotzi lecha min ha'aretz, because that was the way it was. They didn't, you didn't even have to make the flour to make the bread. It was hamotzi lecha min ha'aretz. The fact that we have to go now, and bezeh sapecha kola, and then kotz v'dardar, and all that, you have to work, and that's all part of the tikkun of the chet. Right? That's all part of it. So meaning, parnasa, we have to realize, we have to go through these motions. That's what we're going, it's affirming, we, Adam Arishon, had lost that level of bitachon, or emunah, and trust in Hashem, and this is the way we reaffirm it by our, putting our efforts into parnasa, and, uh, and, and hopefully God is going to go take care of us. <clears throat> so Clay Yaker says that ribis is the complete antithesis to that. Because ribis, you're getting money without having to do anything. There's no effort. You're, you're being supported by, without effort. He said, that undermines the commandment that we have to work to make a living. So it's a lack in that concept. It's a lack in that concept. Therefore, a person's not allowed to take ribbis. You're not allowed to take ribbis because taking ribbis means that you don't perceive that a man is obligated by God to correct that lack of emuna that Adam Arishon had by having to work in order to... Uh, so not working is, is, is the undermining of that concept. But it's okay with the goy. Ah, so he says, why is it okay with the goy? So you've got to remember when the Klayakr lived in order to understand this. Mm-hmm. The Klayakr says, he says that... This is what he says, okay? It's not very PC. He says, he says by a goy, you're lucky if you get your principal back. <laughs> so therefore, it's not... Because they used to do that. They, they used to expel. Every time the debt got too big, they expelled them from the land. So he says, therefore, by a guy, it's not, it's not a sure thing. Where it's not a sure thing, it doesn't undermine the concept of you have to put effort into work. To learn. But where, it is, where it's not a sure thing, then you can do it. But if it's a sure thing, ironclad, you can't do. And, and ribis generally is ironclad, and therefore you can't live off ribis. This is the Clay Yoko says, understanding the idea. But a very, very deep idea because we live exactly the opposite. Every one of us is trying to figure out what's our financial plan that we no longer have to work. Right? When am I going to retire? When am I not going to have to work? That I can have the money in the bank and I can live off the uh, percentages and, and, even as, and the clay is saying it's the opposite. He's saying, like, no, you need to work. You're, by working, you're justifying the fact that that you understand that this is what you have to do for, for God to give you what you need to have. There is no plan over there that you don't work. The plan is to work in order to fulfill the Zeh Sapecha Tocha Lecha. That's the... Uh, that's the uh... So let's take it a little bit... Uh, let's, because we said the, the, the mitzvah of the moon, we said a Shemitah. comes out a, a fascinating thing here. It comes out that what does emuna mean? Meaning, if a person really feels that it's his efforts that are building his bank account, if a person really believes that, that my, what I do determines how much money I'm going to have. And it's not just, well, God says that I have to work, and blessing comes from God, right? That's a muna. Muna is God says I have to work, and when I work, He will bless me and He will give me what I need. As opposed to my work directly correlates to what I have. So we said the whole idea of shemitah makes no sense. If it's my efforts is what's going to be my bank account, then not working, I'm depleting my bank account. If I'm willing to keep shemitah, what does that show? That I recognize that my work has nothing to do with what's in my bank account. 
And the fact that I'm willing to take off a year and not do anything because God has instructed that year I'm not going to work, that shows that the six years, so it means the one, the year, year, the seventh year is not just the Muna of the seventh year. What the seventh year is, that instills the concept of a Muna for the other six years. And the depth of it is even more. It means the greater the person's level of emuna, the more it becomes a vessel for bracha. The greater a person's emuna, the more it comes. Now, bracha comes in different ways. Like Rashi says, we find next week's parsha. And, and bracha can be either you're going to make an abundance or you're not going to need a lot. The food is blessed within his stomach, Rashi says, is that it's either, you know, you're going to bring in a lot, right? So on the income side, it'll be a lot, or the expense side won't be that, that, that amount. But that's bracha either way. But that bracha comes from the amuna we have in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the Shemitah year is not just the amuna for the Shemitah year. It's for the other six years as well. And that's the point. That's the, so in Kisavo El Aretz, when you come into the land, the focus is the Shemitah year. Means, yeah, but we're not starting Shemitah right now. It's true you're not starting the Shemitah year right now. But you are starting the other years right now. For the, other, for the land, for the Kedushas Aretz to be Chal and the Bracha to be Chal, you need to understand is that what I'm doing right now is not a reflection of what I have. What I'm doing right now is I understand that I have to trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because the idea, I'm focusing on the Shemitah. The Shemitah is what allows me to be successful. What I'm being successful is not what I'm doing. It's the fact that I'm going to keep the Shemitah, which I recognize that it's Imuna. If I recognize it's Imuna, then I'm going to be blessed for the six years as well. Right? And on a, uh, yeah, as, as the Ramban says, it's called, it's called Shabbos. Because the same thing applies with Shabbos on the other six days too. Right? Used to be, and you don't have that in a sign anymore, but used to be a hundred years ago, when Jews were living in the United States when they first came to this country, you know, that they were told, if you don't come, back, if you don't come on Saturday, don't bother coming back Monday. It's a big Nisayon. But if the idea is, and that's the, the Rashi brings down, is that the bracha of the Mon is that we got twice on Friday. That doesn't mean the bracha of the Mon is we got twice on Friday. If you keep Shabbos, you'll always have twice on Friday. Meaning there always will be enough if you have the trust in the Kodesh Baruch that you're going to keep the Shabbos, then you'll have enough. You know, somebody told me that when Rav Gabai first opened up, he had two minyonim. There was an early minyon on Shabbos, on Shabbos morning, like a Hashkomen minyon, and there was a later minyon. And most of the f- people that he was working with had, came to the early minyon, because they would go to come to davening, and then they would go work. So they davening, and then we go work. Baruch Hashem, it's the other way around now. This is, the first minion is very small, and the second minion is the big minion because he's been very successful in working with them. That they're not working on Shabbos. But the idea, really, and that's the message here of, of Shemitah, and I think it's, it's, it's just a, a critical message for us. You know, this is, the, this is Amuna. Amuna is that we need to recognize that. Our efforts, we have to do, we have to, it has to be efforts that make sense. You know, say, so, okay, fine, I'm going to jump up three times, and I'm, I'm jumping, I'm doing push-ups, God's going to, no, it has to, it has to be something that you have to be a vessel through which brocha can come. But at the end of the day, it's the level of the emunah of understanding the brocha, that's going to be the expanse of what it is. And the Shemitah is what shows that. Shemitah is, you're willing to take off that year that shows the other six years is what is giving me my... Uh, is giving me my blessing. And I think that's a very important message. I mean, Rav Moshe says the reason why, he says the reason why a generation of, of, of Jews were lost. I mean, you look at the generation after, the Jews that came from Europe were mostly religious Jews. The next generation went off. And he said that they saw their parents, they're struggling. Shabbos, lose your job the next day. They kept Shabbos, they kept, but they complained about it. They said, how difficult it is to be a Jew. You lose your... It says, Ramosha says, unless the message is good to Zayin Ayyid, how good it is to be a Jew, not how difficult it is to be a Jew. So why are the kids going to want something that's difficult? Kids want to be able to take something that they appreciate, that they, they see as wonderful. Rabbi, but everybody keeps Shemitah? 
So in Eretz Yisrael, the, the, the Shemitah is a whole different area. In the, uh, in the Aliyah, when they, when they all came up in the, uh, 18, in, in the 1800s, they literally had no, nothing to eat. They had nothing to eat. And they sent back to, War, to Warsaw, to Reb Chaim Oz Grudzinski, who was the head of the uh, Litvish community, was the, uh, in, at the time, what do we do? So he came up with an idea at that time, a few of the rabbis supported it as well, they had what's called the Mechira Sa'aretz. They sold the land that they owned to a non-Jew, and therefore they did not have to keep the Shemitah. Now he did it at the time because just the, they, would, they were not able to. Now whether or not Shemitah applies from the Torah law today's discussion, some say Shemitah will only apply when everybody's back learning in the, living in the land of Israel, but for sure there's a rabbinical requirement. Yovel not, but Shemitah, yes. So therefore, that's what they ended up doing. So see, people said, oh, that's a good idea. Let's do it every uh, seven years. And that's why they have this big debate going on in Israel today, is that can you rely on the mechira? They sell it to Arabs. And now can I go ahead and purchase it? So you'll go to certain stores and they'll say, yes, they don't rely on the mechira. And they have specifically you know, food that did not come from Eretz Yisrael. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's a, that's a big debate, and it's based both on halacha, it's based on po- politics, it's based on philosophy. There's a lot of debate going on in terms of what they do for the for the laws of shemitah today. But there there are, and it's becoming more and more farmers that are in the in the religious community that are keeping. You know, and they come around in the United States. You can give money towards becoming a partner with a farmer in Israel to keep the laws of shemitah, and they use that money to help offset. Mm-hmm. The, uh, you know, but we, uh, even back in the day, the Ra- Rashi brings down is that, that many people did not keep the laws of Shemitah because it took so much for people to, you know, that's one of the reasons it says in next year, in, in Bukhaz, we got thrown out of the land. The Shavsa Aretz, the land is going to, the 70 years that we were kicked out from the first base of Megdash to the second base of Megdash, the Ramban, Rashi brings down the calculation, Ramban goes into more depth, represent all the Shemitahs that they never kept. Oh. The 490 years of uh, they did not keep the Shemitah. The 70 Shemitah were not kept, and that's why we, that now the land is going to rest because you did not keep it. So it's, it's a big Messiah, and it's not, we're not talking about it. It's, the, the, it's like some of the, the, the four Shemitah, it's the most difficult mitzvah in the Torah. It's the ultimate mitzvah of Bitochon, it's the ultimate mitzvah of Emunah, showing your trust in Akkadish Baruch Hu. But really, what it ties into, and that's what I'm saying is, it ties into the idea is that God is responsible for our financial well-being, which I think that's why you have tzedakah in this week's parsha, because that's an underpinning of tzedakah as well. Tzedakah is, I'm the conduit to, for God's wealth. It's not me who's helping the Ani. God has enabled me, he's using me as a shliach to be able to help the Ani. Ribbis, as we saw the kliyakar. Ribbis means that you think you're controlling your finances, and therefore you don't have to work. You figure out another way how you go ahead. You don't. You don't have that right to do that. You know, so therefore, so that, but that is the, and I think that just, and the last piece again, just to reiterate, is that a person's financial well-being, you know, the way, we, you know, is that the focus, I think, is wrong. You know, we, we're working to the vacation, we're working to the retirement. We're, the working itself, there's the value in the work in and of itself, but also the idea when we're working and the focus that we have, that we are now, whatever our mission from God, everyone has their own mission, but the work itself is part of that, and that's how we understand that, and it's really coming from God, and, and as opposed to trying to avoid having to do it, that will actually create a greater level of bracha and fulfillment in the things that we actually do. Mm-hmm. So what about Yovel? Is the people have to give the home in Yovel? Yovel, the, the, the Pasuk says, the blessing of the Pasuk is there'll be four years of prosperity. Mm-hmm. You'll have the year before, the sixth year, mm-hmm. you'll have the seventh year, the eighth year, which is the Yovo, and the year after, because nothing's growing, yeah. you'll have four years of prosperity to able to keep the Yovo. They would able to have four years. So that, that's, you know, that's one of the questions. So then why didn't they do it? Why didn't they try it? They, they weren't even able to try, or wanting to try, taking, you know, that, taking off the time. But think about it. It's like, you know, you know, it's interesting today in Israel, by the way, there is a concept of sabbatical, Shemitah. Every person who is, runs a business has to put money into the employee's account that allows them, is it, is it every seven years also, that they can take off, they don't have to work. Yeah. 
That's the concept that came out. And the, teachers. Teach, is it teachers just teachers? I think it's, it's not just teachers. I believe it's, uh, is it just teachers? It's mostly teachers, yeah. Teachers. Yeah. They have seven, there's a, there's a sabbatical. Sabbatical. Yeah. But that's, it's built into the system. They, uh, How do you know yeah. the balance? It says that it teaches us on Sadaka how much money to give yeah. and, you know, there's an amount. Mm-hmm. But to work, how do you know when enough is enough? I think everyone has to look at what they can do with their time effectively, but not wanting to work because I want to be able to go sit and, uh, you know, uh, sit on the beach. That's not effect. I mean, I think it has to be in terms of what the effect. If it's because I'm going to be involved in my some communal work, I'm going to be doing mitzvahs. I mean, I think that that's, the cheshbon has to come in. The question is not, it's not how much you're working, but it's what are you doing with the time that you're not working. There's actually there's an unbelievable there's a sefer called Chos in Yeshua. Chosen Yeshua is divided into two halves. It works on the Yisachar Zvulun concept, meaning there are people that are learning and there are people that are working. You know, when you're supporting somebody in learning, so you have a partnership in his mitzvah and it's considered as if you're learning as well. So he says people make a mistake. People think just because you write the check, so now you're considered to be a partner in the learning. He says that's not really true. He says the question is like this. Let's say you have time off. You have vacation, or you have, you know, what are you doing with that time? He says, the whole heter that you don't have to sit and learn is because I have to work, right? He says, so if you're working, it's not held against you that you're not learning. So you're supporting someone in learning. You're showing, I would have liked to have learned. I can't, but at least I'm going to support him. But now I have time off. If I'm not learning when I have that time off, that shows that even if I didn't have to work, I wouldn't be learning anyway. Then you don't have a chelik in the learning. You know? So there's a balance. I mean, it's not, obviously we can't just sit and learn all the time. There has to be... You know, the, the Nitziv writes that his father used to see him studying so much, he used to say, go outside and play with a goat. You need to go outside and play with a goat. They had a family goat, whatever. Go play with a goat. He says, no, you can't sit and look. You, you need, a person needs to, uh, you know, but the, learning, the, 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 the working is not to go play with a goat. The goat is to be able to come back more effectively and work more effectively. You know, that's the, uh, you know, you need, a person has the human being. You'd have to take the time. You have to, you have to enjoy God's world too. You know, God gave the world. Some Shamsha Fall Hirsch says when he was in his 80s, he made his students take him to the Alps. He lived in Germany. He went to the Alps. They said, You're like 89 years old. What are you schlepping to the Alps? So he said, You know, I don't have much time to live. But when, when God, then I come up to the base in Shalmala, God can't say to me, Why well, didn't study his Torah? So I study his Torah. But he's going to say, why don't you go see my Alps? I've got to make sure I go see his Alps. You know, <laughs> the world is here. I've got to go see the Alps. You know? so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.